So we are in this sermon series called Believe, and if you are a first-time visitor, um, i got to just give you the quick synopsis. It's the Gospel of John, so there's four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And the whole reason why John is writing this Gospel is so that you and I would have opportunity to believe that Jesus is God in the flesh. The Word became flesh to dwell among us. Now, if you've been with us, you understand... um, So far, we've been looking primarily at Jesus ministering to the Jews. In fact, out of all the people groups that Jesus could have become when he took on flesh, he could have been a Roman, but he did not. He could have been an Egyptian, but he did not. He could have been a Philistine or a Greek. He could have been anything, but instead Jesus becomes a Jew. And he comes from a long line of Jews, obviously. And if you've been following with us in the first um, three chapters, you've seen that he worshipped in a Jewish temple as a boy. He, as an adult, went to Jewish weddings. He went to the temple as an adult, and he confronted Jewish leaders, and he turns over the tables, and he... He's, got a, he's a Jew, and he follows Passover, so he's got all this Jew. And if you were just simply reading those first couple of chapters, it would be easy to assume that Jesus came for the Jews. But the Bible begins to unfold and tell us the rest of the story is that Jesus not only came as a Jew for the Jews, but really for the world. In fact, some of his last words to his disciples As he ascended into glory, he tells them to be his disciples to all the nations. And in the book of Acts says, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, which is Jews, Judea, which are Jews, Samaria, which are not Jews, they're half-breeds, to the outermost parts of the world. Now, I don't know about you, but I am not a Jew, and probably most of us in this room do not have Jewish blood. We didn't grow up Jews. But praise God that he not only came for the Jews, but also for the rest of the world. So we have opportunity to be saved. Now, the scripture and the narrative is going to take us now to the next phase of Jesus' journey. And he's actually going to be ministering to a different people group. And the story is a pretty famous story. It's called The Woman at the Well. Have you all heard this story before? She's... We don't know her name. She's simply referred to as a Samaritan woman. We don't know much about, let's be honest, how much do you really know about this woman? Do you know much about her? Besides the fact that they made that song, Samaritan woman. All right, some of you are like, this church is weird. Okay. (laughs) So, (laughs) that's funny. Come on. (laughs) So, that's not the song. But, But what do we really know about the Samaritans? Jesus mentions them in one of his messages, and he's, it, the story is found in Luke, and I'm going to cross-reference this to set the table to where we're going. But it tells us, and we know the story to be called the Good Samaritan, right? That's, that story is, has been very powerful in our culture. We even have Good Samaritan laws because of the story. And so in that story, it says that, a, that a, um, an expert in the law, an expert in the religious Jewish law approached Jesus, and he asked him this deep question. He said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus, knowing that this man is an expert in the law, he says, well, what does the law say? And the guy summarizes all the laws, and he he nails it. He says, the first law is that you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength. And then he says, and the second is this, to love your neighbor as yourself. And so Jesus tells this 
expert in the law, you, you got it right, now go do it. And then this expert in the law tries to, the Bible tells us, he tries to justify himself. And he starts a religious theological conversation with Jesus. And by the way, that's never a good idea. So he, he says, well, who is my neighbor? Just a casual question. And, and Jesus begins to tell him the story. He said, there is a man who was going from Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the holy city to Jericho, which is a Jewish city. And he said he is robbed and he is beat up and he is left to die. Now, this is a, this is a expert in the law listening to the story. And then Jesus says, okay, now here comes the first person to render aid, and he is a, a priest. So for the Jewish expert in the law would say, here comes help. But Jesus tells him this guy who is a religious priest walks on by, shows no compassion to this person who is literally dying. But then Jesus says, there's a second person that comes, and the second person is a Levite. Again, if you are a Jewish scholar, you understand that these come from the tribe of Levi, and they are the priesthood. They love God. Surely they're going to love their fellow man. But Jesus says he walks on by. But then Jesus says, a third person comes along, and this is a Samaritan And the Samaritan renders aid. He sees the need. He has compassion on this person. He bandages this person's wounds. He takes him and puts him on his own animal. He takes him to the city. He finds a place for him to stay the night, and he pays his expenses, and so he takes care of this person. So Jesus asked this religious person, which is the one who loved his neighbor because you you yourself said the two greatest things that we must do is love God with all our heart all our soul all our strength and love our neighbor as ourselves which of these three loved their neighbor and the man wouldn't even say the word samaritan he said the one who has had compassion the jews of the day it was said that when they prayed, they would often, especially the religious leaders, would beat their chest and say, thank God that I'm not a tax collector. Thank God that I, these are the religious leaders, that I am not a woman. Thank God that I am not a Samaritan. See, Jews hated Samaritans. Now, in order for us to really understand why they hated Samaritans, you've got to go back a little bit in history. And I'm going to give you a quick history, and I hope I don't lose you. <laughs> why are y'all laughing? <laughs> so the guy in the top of, the, of this drawing is Abraham. We know him as a father of faith. His story is found in Genesis. Father Abraham had many sons. Had many, okay. Some of y'all know that song? All right. Some of y'all like have no idea that song. It's okay. But he has many sons. But if you notice the flow chart, the lady in the middle is the wife of the promise. Her name is Sarai or Sarah. That's the promise that God has given to Abraham that his offspring Three promises. Land, he's going to give them land. We call that the promised land. Then he said, I'm going to make you uh, a great nation, so descendants, many children. Now, if you know the story, his wife can't have babies. That's, that's the, the problem. God has promised many descendants, but she can't have babies, so that's a problem. And then God says, those who bless you, I will bless. Those who curse you, I will curse. This is God's promise to Abraham. So there's a whole lot of story that takes place here, and he has a woman on the side by the name of Hagar, and they have a baby by the name of Ishmael. Are you listening to me, Siri? Siri's trying to talk to me. So Hagar has a son, Ishmael, but Sarah is the one that's going to bring the promise. So Abraham has a son called Isaac. So remember that, Abraham, Isaac. Now, he has a bunch of other wives later, and these are all, I mean, another wife and a bunch of other kids, but 
we'll just kind of don't think about those for now. So then Isaac, his son, gets married to Rebekah. And Rebekah and Isaac have two sons, Jacob and Esau, twins. But the promise is not going to go through Esau. It's going to go through Jacob. So Jacob now has, he marries two sisters. And I know this sounds like, you know, it'd be on Geraldo or whatever that, you know, one of those shows because it's getting interesting. But he, has, he marries two sisters, Rachel and Leah. And then he's got two servants on the side, their servants, and they have a bunch of kids. They have 12 boys and one daughter. The 12 boys are what we call the 12 tribes of Israel. Have you heard of the 12 tribes of Israel? All right. So this is important because as we will see, well, let me just give you some more history. So the people now, if you read Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, you, you realize they go out of Egypt, they go to the promised land, they have a lot of people now, and they settle into the promised land under Joshua. And the people of Israel are saying, we want a king because everyone else around us has kings. God says, I'm your king. And they're like, no, 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 we know you are a king, but we want an earthly king. And so God says, all right, I'll give you an earthly king, and I'll give you Saul. And Saul is a terrible king. So God takes the kingdom away from Saul, and he gives it to a guy by the name of David. David is really the first real king from this bloodline, and David rules over the the 12 tribes, and it is a united kingdom. But David has some problems, and he starts marrying a lot of different women and has sons from different women, and there's tor- turmoil in his home, and he's got a son with Absalom with problems. he got Solomon with problems. It's a lot of drama, a lot of history. Now, I hope I'm not losing you because I'm going somewhere with this. So Solomon is the next heir of the king, kingdom. Solomon is going to rule over the 12 tribes, but Solomon is worse than his father, David. David loved the Lord with all of his heart, even though he made mistakes. The Bible tells us that Solomon began to drift as a king, as a leader of God's people, and began to marry many foreign women. And when you marry many foreign women, they bring with themselves their culture, their gods, their idols, and so they began, they began a season of high, bringing under this season kind of a hybrid worship. We're going to worship the one true God, but we'll also worship this God and this God on this mountain and this God and this God and this God. And it got so bad that they actually started having child sacrifices to these gods. They were burning their children. So God, in his frustration because he had set his people apart to be his people, allows there to be a civil war. And the nation, the 12 tribes, splits. Ten tribes go north, and two tribes go south. This is more history than you'll ever want to know, but I got to just tell you. If you notice, the new capital of the northern kingdom is Samaria. The southern kingdom, which are two tribes, have the capital of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, they keep worshiping there in their temple. In the northern kingdom, they set up another temple, and they began to worship on a different place. And so these are God's people, and then now they're divided. Now, because the nation has drifted from God, God allows a foreign army to come in and overthrow them, the northern kingdom first. The northern kingdom falls to this this nation called Assyria. They are the most wicked people on the planet. And they come in to the northern kingdom and they overthrow them. The result of that, they start, Assyrians marry Jews and a whole new people are born. And they're called Samaritans. They're half Jews and yet half Assyrians. So a true Jew would not recognize them as a brother or a sister because they, they had Assyrian blood. It was a mixed race that now began. And so now this is where this story in John chapter 4, a little background of the history, hundreds of years of history there, 
Jesus now enters the scene. John chapter 4. The scripture tells us, it says, now he had to go through Samaria. But if you look at a map, there's alternative routes. Most Jewish men, rabbis, would not go through Samaria because of the racial tension that was there. And they would go around. They would cross the Jordan and go up the north of the Jordan and then go around this area. But the scriptures tell us that Jesus has to go through Samaria. And I believe the reason why he has to go to Samaria is because there is a woman there. It's a divine appointment, and he's got to meet her. Verse 5. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar near the plot of, now notice the history here, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given his son Joseph. Remember Abraham, Isaac, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph is one of Jacob's sons. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? Now his disciples had gone into the town to buy some food. Verse 9, these are the very first words that come out of this woman's mouth, and notice her words. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? Jesus, in his earthly, fleshly body, he sleeps, he eats, he drinks, he is thirsty. But I believe he could have kept on going because the Bible tells us that he fasted for 40 days. So he wasn't dying of thirst. But he sits next to this well, and he is waiting. And the scriptures say it is noon. The ladies don't come to the well at noon because it's the heat of the day. They usually come in the morning or they come in the early evening. But Jesus is there and he is waiting specifically for this woman and he has this conversation with her and he asks her, will you give me a drink? He needs to drink from her cup. And the very first words that she says to him, she plays the race card because she's grown up. All she's known is that our people don't mix with your people. You are a Jew. Your kind are not welcome here. Move along. This is what she grew up in. And yet Jesus answered her. And he's gentle with her. He doesn't get all defensive. He doesn't start, you know, well, I'm a Jew and you're, yeah, yeah, yeah. And starts that whole debate. But he says to her, if you knew the gift of God, and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this so-called living water? And then she's going to now go historical on him. She says, are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well And drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. And again, notice Jesus' response. Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water from this well will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water that I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Now, if you fast forward a couple of chapters in the Gospel of John, you will understand that the living water that Jesus is referring to is really the Holy Spirit. Salvation comes to the Jews, but it also comes to the Gentiles and everyone else in between. Nicodemus, two weeks ago, we looked at it. He's a religious leader, a Jew, and he had a a conversation with Jesus, and Jesus tells Nicodemus, it's not about your religion. It's not about you being Jew. It's not about you from the line of Abraham. It's not about the temple. It's not about any of those things. Nicodemus, you must be born from above. And he quotes the Old Testament. 
Just like Moses lifted up the serpent, so the Son of Man must be lifted up and die on the cross. Nicodemus, the only way to get into heaven is through Jesus by the Spirit of God. That same truth applies to this woman. She's thirsty. She's there. But she needs a lot more than just water. She needs something for her soul. And the only thing that she really truly needs is Jesus. He says, if you knew who is asking you right here in front of you, the gift of God is right here. I will give you living water, the Spirit of God. You know, we live in a a time of racial tension, and if we're honest, we've always lived in a time of racial tension. It's just been part of the fabric of the United States, but it's also been part of the fabric of the world, it it appears. And I'll I'll tell you just a little bit about my story. My story is, is not too impressive, but it's my story, so I'm sticking to it. So my parents were raised in the 1950s, and that was the time of a lot of civil rights and racial tension. And my dad um, and my mom, they, they were, um, well, I was going to say they were Hispanic. My mom is still Hispanic. My, my father is, is no longer with us. He's in glory. But my mom, you know, they would, they would tell us stories about what it was like when they were growing up as young men and young women in the 1950s. And so they would say that when they would go to the movie theater that, you know, based upon the color of your skin, if you were darker skin, you had to sit in the balcony. And so my dad had two brothers, and my dad's brothers were darker skin. And so my dad had to make a choice because they would tell his brothers to go sit up in the balcony. And my dad was lighter skin, and so technically my dad could go sit in the, in the lower area, or he could follow his brothers, and my dad would go sit with his brothers. My dad and my mom, you know, they, uh, a lot of the kids, my dad would tell me that they would uh, be made fun of at lunchtime at school because they would take tortillas, and they would take their tacos for lunch. And so the kids would look at them with their bologna sandwiches, and they say, what's wrong with you? Why are you eating a bean taco And my dad uh, would joke later and says, you know, now all the white people love tacos. But but back then, it was kind of like he was ashamed, and he said he would hide his tacos because he didn't want to feel inferior to to other people. And so my parents never had a chance to finish um, high school. They were both, uh, they dropped out of school early on, and they became migrant farmers, and they basically went to different places, and they worked the fields, and so my dad would, would you know, he grew up in this culture thinking, and this was a, a reality to him, is that, and this is, these are my dad's words, that, that the white man was the boss, and so when he had kids, they had kids, um, they would instill these values that were their values, and they would say, you know, you don't need to learn Spanish because we want you to succeed in life. We want you to go finish high school. We want you to go to college. We want you to, to achieve everything we couldn't achieve. That was the value that they gave us. So I grew up hearing all this, and, and I didn't realize it at the time as a young boy and as a teenager, but I started kind of having a lot of insecurities around certain people groups. And so I started playing this race card because it, it was a security thing. It was like, I'm brown, kind of. I'm like lighter shade of brown. But I would say, I'm, I'm brown and proud, you know, and I was because I knew my mom and my dad and my grandmother didn't speak any English, and I, I was very proud to be a Hispanic. And so when God called me to ministry, I said, I'm going to go reach brown people for Jesus because they need to hear the gospel. That was kind of my mantra And so God sent me to Laredo, Texas. And Laredo, Texas is not South Texas. It is North Mexico. It is a completely different world. And I was there for five years, and I was humbled because I didn't speak Spanish that well. Because my mom and dad said, you don't need to speak Spanish. If you're going to succeed in this world, don't speak Spanish. And so I got to Laredo, Texas, and all the people there said, what's wrong with you? You're a Hispanic. You should be ashamed of yourself. You don't know Spanish. And I was like, I don't fit into this world. I don't fit into this world. I don't know where I fit into. 
So God called us out of Laredo, and, and my wife is from San Antonio, and she doesn't speak Spanish. And we're like, surely San Antonio is a perfect place to go start a church. But before we started the church, we had to go to Dallas and finish up my seminary training. So we moved to Dallas, Texas. And so, again, you got to understand, we're Hispanic. We have two kids. We're going to seminary, and they give us free museum, children's museum passes. And so we go to, um, it's right around that, the Cotton Bowl area in Dallas. If you've ever been, there's a lot of museums. So we notice that there is like this big rally taking place. And we hear Mexican music, and it's a lowrider convention. And, and I'm, I'm telling Elizabeth, I was like, this, these are our people. <laughs> We're brown. They're brown. Laredo is too brown. They, <laughs> but these are our people. So we're, again, we're pushing strollers. We're going to the museum. And we walk into to this lowrider convention. And these guys are like looking at us like, what's up, Holmes? <laughs> you know? And they got bandanas and like they look muscles and they just like, they look tough. And I'm like, I'm trying to, I'm trying to like fit in with them. And I was like, hey, Holmes, you know? <laughs> What you looking at, Holmes? And no, I didn't say that. I'd have got beat up. But I told Elizabeth, I said, we don't belong there either. I was like, we don't belong anywhere. When we started this church, Confession, um, I wanted to reach second and third generation Hispanics. Hence the name Vista. We didn't want it to be too Spanish because we were afraid Spanish speakers would come and I don't speak the language. But I wanted, I, I was like, there's got to be a church to reach that. And then early on, God convicted me, and he said, you don't need to reach a people group. You need to reach all people. And that was a light bulb moment for me. That was like, you know, you reach your community and, you, and let God do what he's going to do. And so when I came to know Jesus, there was, it was a white man. Like my dad says, don't listen to the white man. They're the boss. But a white man led me to the Lord, and his name is Whitney Anderson. And after I became a follower of Jesus, I was mentored in ministry by a black man. His name is Calvin Clark. And so God just showed me that white men, black men, brown men, we all are part of the same body of Christ. And so this is where Jesus is trying to help this woman. She's got layers and layers and layers of History, your people and our people, we don't talk. We don't drink from the same water. Keep on moving. This is not your neighborhood. Keep on going. We're Jews, you're Samaritans. But the irony is they come from the same bloodline. They come from Abraham. And for, if you're a, a, a Christian, the irony when we hate somebody because of the color of their skin or their ethnicity or their background or their culture, the irony is we share the same blood that's red, that's Jesus. Because he's for all people, not just for the Jews. If we're honest, none of us deserve salvation because he came as a Jew. But by his grace, he came for all people. Every tongue, every tribe, every nation. That's what the scriptures tell, tell us. So, so then the conversation is going to get personal. Now it was, it was, it was at a very surfacey level with you know, race. But now it's going to get personal in verse 15. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water from. And he told her, he said, go call your husband and then come back. She says, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you are right when you say that you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands and the man you now have. He's not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. So if you look at this woman, we don't know her name, but we know that she comes from a mixed race. So she's got that card against her. Okay, the Jews don't like her. But now we find out that she's grown up in a very abusive, broken home, broken life. I don't know what it's like. I'm, I'm not a woman. I'm a man. But, I mean, to be in that culture, 
to have men leave you and then another man take you and say, I promise I will take you and then leave you and then on and on and on and on. And now she's with a guy who's not even her husband. She has a lot of hurt. She probably doesn't trust men. She probably doesn't trust this Jewish rabbi. And, and I think a lot of times that's probably why she came to the well alone, because she didn't want to talk to people. In fact, some scholars believe she was shunned by other women because other women would come together in the morning or in the evening, and she comes, comes all alone. And when we are struggling with things in life, we often want to just be alone. We, we isolate ourselves from other people. But I got to tell you, every one of us in this room probably have been wounded or hurt by people along our life journey, and we need each other. There's this couple in our, my wife was telling me, um, there's this couple that we knew 20 years ago when we were in Denton, Texas. Um, we were young college students, and we had a big college ministry, like 700 college students, and so there was a certain group of us that knew certain people were going to go into ministry, and we were just kind of watching to see what God would do with them. And this one particular guy, he, he literally stood out among all the other people, and every guy wanted to be like him because he was just this awesome man of God. And there was this young lady that all the young ladies wanted to be like because she was this awesome woman of God. And they started dating, and everybody said, that's the perfect couple and they got married, and they went on. I think they had like five or six kids. And so I hadn't seen them. I lost touch with them 20 years later. My wife tells me, she says, you know what? And she showed me this Facebook post. She said, this man, I'm not going to mention his name, this man left his wife for another woman. And she posted on her Facebook page how, how her heart was grieved to lose her husband. And so... Immediately, everybody started coming alongside her and praying for her. And so there's a tension when there's something going on. We don't want people to know about it. We would rather just kind of be to ourselves. And I'll be honest with you, I felt this this summer when our son was diagnosed with cancer. I didn't want anybody to know. But when I opened up, that's when God can minister to us. And some of you here are hurting, and you're like this woman. You don't want to come into the light. You want to stay in darkness. And you got a problem with your marriage. you got a problem with your family. you got a problem with your past. you got a problem with whatever. But I'm telling you, God wants to meet you where you're at. That's why Jesus was at the well that day. And he wasn't going to leave until he had this conversation with her. And I believe that God wants to meet some of you where you are at. And you have a choice to make. Will you come to him? And you'll come defensive, and you'll come with all your reasons, like this woman. But he's just going to say, woman, or in this case, man, I got something that you need, me. This is going to satisfy that thirst that you long for, that you're trying to find in the world. The world is not going to fill that void. Only I will. And this is why Jesus meets her just as she is. Now, they've talked about race, and now they're going to talk about religion. These are things you probably never should talk about. These are hot topics. You don't want to, like, talk about race and religion and the Dallas Cowboys because it sets people off. Or the Patriots. So this is what the conversation now turns to. And I want you to notice the historical background. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet because you know that I got all these husbands. I know You know my past. And our ancestors, here we go again, worshipped on this mountain. But you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know. For salvation is from the Jews, not for the Jews, but it's from the Jews. Yet a time is coming 
and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth. That's a trinity, by the way. Father, Spirit, and Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. There's a time when true believers will understand the trinity. And he says, Yet a time has come in and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the Spirit and in truth. And then Jesus goes on and says, or the woman says, I know the Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he'll explain everything to us. And then Jesus ends the conversation for today. We'll pick it up next week. He says this. I am the, I am, oh, excuse me, I the one speaking to you. I am he. And he drops the mic and he walks away. She's waiting for the Savior. She's waiting for Messiah. She's wait- and he's like, I'm here. And maybe some of you are waiting, but Jesus is here. All you need is him. That's why he came. That's why John wrote, so that you and I might have an opportunity to believe that he is the Son of God that dies for us. And we just have to believe. We confess we're sinners and we Believe that he is the perfect one to save us. And when you do, the Bible says you receive him and he becomes your Lord. You are now part of the family. Now me, bring it full circle. Kind of that whole Good Samaritan question. Do you know that Jesus loves you? This woman had baggage she had issues with her race. She had hundreds of years of, of issues, and she's a woman, and she's been mistreated, but yet she come to the point where she had to personally understand that Jesus loved her. Jesus loves you guys, and I can tell you the reason why I can tell you that is because I didn't grow up in the faith, and I got a lot of baggage But when Christ showed his love for me, I understood that he loves me in spite of all the junk in my past and the sin in my past. He loves me. And no sin is too great for the love of God. And I don't know what baggage you've been carrying, and I don't know what your past is, but I'm telling you, he loves you. And he's that, the irony, he's that good Samaritan is that he won't walk on by. He will stop and help you. And then the last question I think applies to all of us. As Christians, are you trying to love all people? All people are created in God's image. Different countries, different languages, different skin colors. But if you're caught up on your skin color or you're Western and we're American and whatever, 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 maybe that's your idol. Because God is bigger than that. And if God loves all people, we should too.